This is, I think, the very first documentary ever made where survivors are confronting perpetrators who still hold a monopoly on power. Hi, I'm Kim Taylor Bennett and welcome to Vice Talks Film. Today I'm joined by Oscar-nominated director Joshua Oppenheimer, who first came to our attention with the film The Act of Killing. Today he'll be joining us to discuss its companion piece, The Look of Silence, which focuses on a family who are still dealing with the repercussions of the 1965 Indonesian genocide. Tidak. Saya menganggap itu tidak besar. Bagaimana mungkin tidak besar? Satu juta orang dibunuh atau lebih. Itulah dia politik. Jadi kepih mak perasaan ini mama tinggal cerak di antara pembunuh anak ini mama. Seandainya aku berbicara di era Orde Baru sama bapak, apa yang akan bapak lakukan dengan aku? Tak bisa kita bayangkan ya. So Joshua, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, and I wanted to jump right back to the beginning when you first landed in Indonesia and you were there doing another documentary um, to do with workers in the field and them trying to unionize and them having difficulty, is that correct? Yeah, it's also how I first came across the 1965 genocide as a whole. I was invited at the age of 26 to help a group of plantation workers make a film about their struggle to organize a union in the aftermath of the Suharto dictatorship, under which unions were illegal, which meant that, of course, the conditions over the decades and decades of dictatorship deteriorated to the point that in uh, 2001, when I arrived, the Belgian plantation on which we were living and plantation workers were making this film, the Belgian company made the women spray the pesticides and the herbicides, and they would give them no protective clothing. And the mist would get into their lungs, and one of the herbicides was so toxic that the would then travel through their blood to their liver and dissolve the fabric of their liver tissue. And the women would turn yellow from liver disease, from jaundice, and die in their 40s from liver failure. And one of the first things they tried to do as a union was to demand protective clothing. And the company hired paramilitaries, thugs, to attack them and to threaten them and with even worse. And the workers dropped their demands immediately. And I asked, how can you let this go so easily? After all, isn't this a matter of life and death for you? And they said, it is, but our parents and grandparents were killed here as part of a mass killing in 1965. They were members of the National Plantation Workers Union. And simply for that, they were seen as likely opponents to the new regime. They were accused of being communists and they were murdered and were afraid this could happen again. And I realized right then that what was killing my friends was not merely poison, but also fear. And this was really an untold story up until this point. That's right, and so, so much so that people couldn't talk about the genocide on the plantation, uh, but, and yet they were living in fear of, its, of, the, of, the, of the perpetrators who were still in power. What they could talk about, though, as a kind of act of resistance, was one victim, Ramli, who was one of the only victims from that whole region whose murder had witnesses. Everyone else had just been killed and thrown in rivers and their families were never told their loved ones had died. So they were therefore unable to grieve, unable to mourn, because they couldn't say they were dead out of deference to the hope that they might come back, they would say they hadn't yet come home. So people would speak about Romley to give voice, I think, to their grief and gradually over the decades, Romley became a synonym for the genocide as a whole. And when we began, after, after the plantation workers said, come back and please make another film about why we are afraid still today, decades on, it was inevitable that they would introduce me to Romley's family. Abang saya, dibunuh itu, Pak. Tapi berhubung, karena Pembunuhan ini di bawah komando Bapak. Bukan kita juga. When I returned in 2012 to make this film, I had no idea that Adi would be the main character. I thought that he would be the person who introduces me to survivors, that helps me think through what really matters to survivors in their experience. But when I sat down with him, he said to me straight away, I've spent seven years watching your footage with the perpetrators. It's changed me. 
I need to meet the men who've killed my brother. I need to confront them. I need to see if they can take responsibility for what they've done. And, and, and then somehow in the hope that if they can, I can forgive them and then make peace with them so that my children can inherit a future where they're not afraid of their neighbors anymore because I don't want my children to grow up with the fear that my father and my mother and I have lived with. And I immediately, reflexively said, absolutely not. Because it's dangerous. I mean, there's never yeah. been a nonfiction film before. This is, I think, the very first documentary ever made where survivors are confronting perpetrators who still hold a monopoly on power. I went and talked to my crew and they said, you see, Joshua, the production of The Act of Killing was well known across this region. If you've seen The Act of Killing, there's a talk show in the film celebrating the shooting of the act of killing while we were still shooting it. So everybody believes, everybody thinks that you're close to the highest ranking perpetrators in the country and some of the high, most powerful men in the country, the vice president of the country, uh, cabinet ministers and so on. And therefore the men Adi wants to confront, men who are regionally powerful but not nationally powerful, they will not dare uh, to detain you let alone attack you because they won't want to offend their superiors whom everyone thinks you're still close to mm. because the act of killing hadn't come out. And otherwise, it, we would never have been able to do this. Yeah. And what were your first impressions of Adi? I mean, he is so, he's such an incredible stillness in this film and you focus, you know, for long periods of time on his face and you see kind of the emotion simmering um, underneath. And I was wondering, yeah, what, what was your first impression of him? And then also, did you ever see him really lose control and get very emotional? Or was he always that controlled? Hadi never really gets angry in any notable way, in any kind of explosive way. His mother, Rohani, she said, if you want to understand uh, who Romley was, her dead son, you must meet Adi. He was born a couple years later, and I was going crazy after Romley died, but because I had Adi, I was able somehow to continue to live. And Adi is just like Romley. He acts like Romley. He talks like Romley. He has the same body language as Adi. It was as though she was saying Adi was a kind of reincarnation of Romley. She called Ram Adi to the village, and this young man comes who's born after the killings, and so therefore wasn't afraid like the rest of his family. And I would say he wasn't afraid uh, like almost anybody I know I came to understand. He's one of the most brave people I know. He remains calm in the face of whatever danger we're facing. All he knew of the killings was the government propaganda that uh, you see in the director's cut of The Act of Killing, this propaganda film that was shown to every child in Indonesia to brainwash them to believe, to believe or force them to at least pretend to believe that what happened in 1965 was glorious and heroic and the victims deserved what they got. He knew that, and he knew it was a lie because he also knew from his mother the story of Romley's murder, which she would tell day and night, again and again, like an echo in her head. That, it was like an echo in her head that would never fade. And he, trying to figure out what really, uh, the, the, the propaganda told him something much bigger happened, but that it was being lied about. And so he latched onto my filmmaking as a way of trying to understand what in a way had made his country the way it is, his village the way it is, and his parents the way they are. He was trying to understand himself, I think, by sort of making himself the very center or kind of motivating force of my filmmaking. And did you coach Adi at all in how to talk to these uh, death squad leaders when he was, you know, testing their eyes? It was always, it was a very close collaboration, so it was always up to Adi whether to reveal that his brother was killed, mm -hmm. with the exception of the very first confrontation, which we kind of shot as a test, uh, so that we could show his family what we were doing and see if they would agree to continuing. Um, and there he, we agreed that he would not say who he was, but apart from that, it was always his choice. All we would do is study the old footage that he filmed, uh, that I had filmed, sorry, years earlier. We would study, study that together, Adi would watch it, and so that he could understand what kind of man this was that he would be approaching and have a basis for the confrontation that would follow. And those, those shots of him, those shots of him is a kind of re refrain throughout the film of him watching the mm -hmm. perpetrators boastful performance, boastful demonstrations of how they killed with this remarkable human gaze in a film all about close-ups somehow. He's watching and watching and that, that's, that's from that, that preparation, from him preparing for the confrontations. And was there any point when you 
or Audi felt uh, in danger when you were doing these interviews? I mean, I, I heard that there were perhaps points where you had a car waiting outside with your passports in it just in case things went awry and you could get out of there. Well, we had Adi's family for some of the more, uh, when we were confronting the more powerful perpetrators, we had Adi's family at the airport ready to evacuate if anything went wrong. And in general, um, we would have a, a getaway vehicles. So it was harder for us to be followed if we had to run away. We were vigilant, I think, and we were, of course, nervous and afraid when perpetrators start uh, threatening Adi and saying, one of them uh, demands to know where he lives. Saya tanya Adi, abang awak itu jadi organisasi di Medan. Pikir, nggak usah, itulah. Bilang karena ada lah, nggak apa. And it's clearly a threat. The perpetrator gets very afraid when confronted with kind of Adi's humanizing gaze mm. because he's forced to see that he killed victims. And we feel, uh, we feel, of course, that he's not afraid of Adi and he's not afraid of me. He's afraid of his conscience. He's afraid of... And, and, and in response to that, he becomes defensive and uh, gets angry and threatens. And yes, we were nervous there. At the same time, uh, I always had the prerogative and the ability to call cut and remind him of some of the most more powerful men with whom I'd filmed. Uh, it, I did that with one of them, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a guarantee that it would work. I mean, there was, there was some shouting and screaming in the pauses, and, and I was just trying to remain very calm and say, and the way I would, it, would, it also had to do with how I would introduce Adi. I would bring Adi and I would say, okay, I'm back after all these years. As you know, I went on to make a film with and I would name the names of some powerful people. This time I'm back, and I want, uh, and I'm with a friend, and he has his own personal relationship to this history. And I want to film instead of instead of your demonstrations and declarations of how you killed. I want to film you and Adi having a conversation. And you might disagree. Try to listen to one another. Try to find common ground. Because I was try I was hoping that Adi would be able to have this dialogue he was hoping for, even though I suspected we would fail. And I told him that. Um, I, I was still trying to facilitate it, and I would say, look, uh, try to have this conversation, and as a thank you for your time, Adi is an optometrist, he will test your eyes and will give you as many pairs of glasses as you should wish if you need, if you need glasses. And that was something I could fall back on when things got really messy. I could say, remember, it's okay if you disagree, because I was trying to maintain safety. I was trying to keep everyone safe. One of the things that I, I thought was almost too perfect was the fact that Adi was an ophthalmologist and he would be interviewing these people and they would have these kind of crazy looking spectacles on and that, you know, he was forcing them to confront the truth and to see clearly while, you know, while they were like trying to sort of dodge things and they were wearing these nuts glasses. It was just such a funny like visual yeah, it's, it's a metaphor, really. I mean, Adi's an optometrist, and he's testing the men's eyes while they're telling the stories of what they did, and just prior to him revealing who he is and confronting them. I felt it became this amazing metaphor for, for blindness, really. I mean, he's trying to help people see who are willfully blind. And the first, initially we started, I t had this idea of using the eye tests in the confrontations for reasons of safety, that... It was a con, it was, first of all, if you're having your eyes tested, I assume you're disarmed, your guard is down. Right. You're less likely to get violent. And also, you're uh, uh, more likely to talk freely. So I, it was very important that the perpetrators volunteer to Adi the same details that they'd said to me about what they'd done, that they told me years earlier, so that Adi would have a basis for the confrontation. If Adi has to say, would have to say to them, you said, this to Joshua seven years ago, of course they would feel trapped and it would be confrontational from the beginning and we would ne have no chance of getting to that dialogue Adi was hoping for. One man in particular, Enong, was telling these horrific details of what he'd done, unspeakable things, things that are straight out of Dante's Inferno, while his eyes are framed with these red, these sort of scarlet test lenses that, uh, with, yeah, I, I had the feeling I was looking at a tiny detail from a Hieronymus Bosch painting and I remember taking one of the cameras that was meant to cover the scene in, in profile and swinging it around and making it a frontal close-up on his face because I thought this is this horrific, mysterious, strange, haunting metaphor for blindness. One of the most shocking things about both these films is the cavalier way in which uh, the perpetrators talk about 
the way they behead these people and torture mm. them and kill them. And I wondered about the psychology behind that and if the theatricality with which that they're delivering this helped them keep a distance from it and, you know, made it seem less real. I spent the first two years filming every perpetrator I could find, slowly working my way up the chain of command. And the 41st perpetrator I filmed was Anwar Congo, the main character in my first film, The Act of Killing. And I could see when I met him, and it's really why I lingered on him and spent five years making the film with him, I could see that the boasting was a sort of desperate attempt to banish pain that was following him around every time, uh, all the time, compelling him to speak about this, but also compelling him to speak about it in this certain way. I, I came to realize that uh, every perpetrator, that the boasting is not pride, but the opposite. Like all boasting, it's defensive. I don't know whether you ever boast, but I'm not proud to say, but I'm sure I do sometimes. And when I do, it's never because I'm feeling proud. It's because I'm insecure. And I'm like a bird who's trying to puff up his feathers to look bigger because I know I'm small. And I think that boasting and trauma are two sides of the same coin. Every perpetrator I've filmed lives their life in kind of manic flight from a pall of guilt and shame that follows them everywhere they go and insinuates itself into their sleep, giving them horrific nightmares. And I, uh, and yet, because they've never been removed from power, they still have available to themselves this victor's history that justifies what they've done. So they do the human thing. They, take the, they try to take these rotten, bitter memories and sugarcoat them in the sweet language of this victor's history, uh, which accounts, of course, for why they're always boasting about the most unseemly details, because those are the things, those are precisely the bitterest memories for them to swallow. The executioners are the ones who need to talk about these awful details. And talking about these awful details in this way, of course, belies the myth that it was heroic, because it's evidently awful. So it's the, I, I, I honed in on that, this surreal phenomenon of the executioners themselves boasting, because it's the, the it is the cra it is the fissures in this facade. Yeah. And I felt that if I focus on that and go into that, the whole facade would come crumbling down. And that, in fact, is humbled to say what's happened in Indonesia as a result of these two films. And I think it's because of that focus on the executioner's boasting. I'd like to talk now about um, how the act of killing came out in contrast to how the look of silence was received. So the act of killing was screened mostly in secret. These well, sort of initially, 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 the first screenings of the act of killing were held in secret uh, at the National Human Rights Commission in Jakarta for Indonesia's leading journalists and filmmakers and uh, celebrities. And then their reaction to the film was so positive and led the mainstream Indonesian media to break what it was at that time a 47-year silence on the genocide. They started talking about the genocide as a genocide, talking about the terrible kind of uh, regime that the killers had built and which was still in place with an honesty that was had never existed before. That opened the space for the, kill, uh, the, the, the screenings of the act of killing to be public. Ultimately there were thousands of public screenings of the act of killing, but the look of silence began its life in public. The act of killing opened the way for it. It had triggered this national conversation about what kind of country the thugs, the paramilitaries, the, mili the military had built. and. Uh, into that space, uh, the act of killing, uh, the look of silence was released by uh, the, the National Human Rights Commission and the Jakarta Arts Council, two government bodies, something unimaginable with the act of killing. There were billboards announcing the first screenings all over Jakarta. It, it was held in uh, Indonesia's largest theater. 3,000 people came to the screening. Uh, the venue holds 1,500, so they had to put on a second screening. Adi came to both screenings. As, an un as a surprise guest at the end and receive a 15-minute standing ovation after each screening. It was National Heroes Day, coincidentally, the day that they hel held the first screening. And trending on Twitter, because Indonesia is the world's largest tweeting country, trending on Twitter that day was, we have a new national hero, and his name is Adi. Subsequently, the film came out uh, a month later with 500 public screenings on the first day. Now we're at over 3,500 screenings. And as I 
told Adi, I said to Adi, I don't think we'll get the apology you're hoping for, but I think that anyone seeing this film right, will see why we fail, and thereby they'll see the abyss of fear and guilt that's dividing everybody, and they'll be forced to acknowledge the prison of fear in which everyone is expected to raise their children, and they won't be able to accept it anymore. And they'll have to support truth, reconciliation, and justice. And because of that, I think the, the film has helped catalyze this nationwide conversation about the need for truth and reconciliation, leading, in fact, to the government introducing a truth and reconciliation bill, woefully inadequate, but a very important uh, a milestone, nonetheless. We have to talk about, of course, where Adi and his family are now. I know that they are somewhere safe and not, not where they spent many, many years. Um, are they well? What's going on they with them? They are well. Um, and Adi was just traveling with me in, in Japan, the UK, France, and Germany just before I came to New York. Um, the family, we, we met about eight months before the film came out. We uh, arranged with a team of 25 people after Adi saw the film and his family said this film really should come out now. We're prepared to move. We, we, we considered not releasing the film, but Adi said he wanted the film to come out. His family said they wanted the film to come out. Uh, so we put together a team of five people full-time and another 20 people working in different capacities part-time to move the family to another part of Indonesia as a plan A, evacuating from Indonesia as a plan B. Uh, it, we didn't want to move the family from Indonesia if necessary, if it wasn't necessary, because we felt uh, it's important for Adi to have a continued connect, relate, ability to see regularly his mother, the rest of his family, and also the children are in Indonesian schools, the family doesn't speak English, and Adi, above all, has a very central role to play, and which now, fortunately, he is playing in the movement for truth, reconciliation, and justice uh, inside Indonesia. The family is thousands of miles now from where uh, they were living out from under, you could say, the shadow of the men who've done this to them, and therefore not living on a day with fear on a day-to-day -day basis. And the mother, was it as cathartic for her as it was for Adi, this film? I think maybe more so, uh, from what I understand. Adi has said, since she's learned of the impact of the film in Indonesia and understands that people across Indonesia have heard what's happened to her son and what happened to her family and what and understand and is recognizing the pain experienced by millions of other families and the whole world is now also opening their eyes to this. She's no longer repeating the same stories, uh, the same story morning, noon and night as Adi would have put it, of Ramli's death. I think that she's finding if not a kind of healing at least a kind of comfort. Do you feel a sadness that you can never return? Yeah, I mean, especially for some some of the people who are credited as anonymous are like my family, and uh, I, I was there when their children were born. I miss them. I, of, of, I'd love to be able to go back. I don't know if I'd go back to make another film, but the, but the, these two films are in a way my love letter to Indonesia. At the same time, I, I feel they're about more than Indonesia. They're about impunity everywhere and the need to face our past everywhere, not just because we have impunity for crimes in our own country here. I mean, we're releasing the look of silence here in the United States at the end of a year where there's been uh, time and again traumatic and important reminders of our un, uh, unresolved history around race, the open wound that race is in this country still. And it's meaningful that we're releasing a film that says you can never escape from your past. You need to turn around and find the courage to confront it and face it. At the same time, I would encourage viewers to recognize that what hap American involvement in Indonesia is also part of our past. It's part of American history. It's, you know, America is in many ways an empire now. And our, what we do in different parts of our empire is part of the history of this country and it's what makes them, it's, it's part of our, uh, our global, the fear sown by this kind of massacre, the trauma created is a crucial ingredient in our global economy. Yeah. It's a part of uh, our consumer economy and this is our story too. It's our story.